Please welcome to the stage Jude Ower and Naomi Augustine Yee in conversation with Akim Steiner. So after this exciting last segment, we are moving into another realm, which is the future. And the future is here, and it is here through two very outstanding people who work in the industry that uh, perhaps many of us dream one day to be part of or perhaps to be able to use. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Naomi Augustin Yee, who is the innovation R&D lead of Magic Leap, and to also introduce Jude Ower, who is the founder and CEO of Playmob. Um, Magic Leap is a technology company that uses spatial computing and virtual reality to create immersive experiences. Dot, 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 because Augustine in a moment will tell you quite how far she and Magic Leap are pushing the frontier of that work. And Playmob is a game development company that engages the gaming community for tangible social impact. And our session will end with a wonderful announcement that uh, we will make also. But right now, let me first of all turn to Augustine. Augustine, the digital future, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, gaming, all these arenas are part of a way of thinking about the future in which people can connect, can understand, can become part of what actually happens in their own environment, but also connect them to essentially the whole world. Through the work that you do at the moment as innovation lead in Magic Leap, give us a glimpse of what makes you most excited about what will be coming next. And perhaps for us to understand quite what this means to us, perhaps as activists or just as citizens or as people who want to perhaps be part of that industry. Over to you. Sure. So um, I work a lot in smart cities, um, which involve merging together lots of sectors. So we're not just talking about just education or healthcare or transportation or energy. We're trying to come up with solutions that are foundational, that can solve multiple problems at the same time. So a lot of my work involves in trying to see what spatial computing looks like five to 10 years in the future. Um, when you're not just wearing the glasses or some kind of hardware on your face, that it's just everywhere, um, stacked on top of each other like, like a radio station or a television station that you can tune into the application layer that's relevant to you. I think that kind of future is very interesting to me because it brings invisible information um, visible and you know, gives people empathy when you can actually see the data in front of you. Can I just jump in? I, I had the United Nations Development Program, um, smart cities, uh, sometimes the destruction of hurricanes we just witnessed in the Bahamas. Imagine for a moment we land the day after Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas. Can you relate that destruction in the midst of which we stand and relate it to how we might be able to work with some of what you are developing to help the Bahamas and its people to recover much more quickly? Right. Um, I think a lot of the uh, tools that we're looking at are aiming to make these types of things preventative measures so that we can actually make predictions better so we can prevent disasters like that and also reduce the cost of travel and resources. You know, we're trying to provide a universal tool. We're not gonna try to solve the hurricane itself, but we're gonna try to help people help ourselves faster and more efficiently. It's interesting you should say that because just a few miles down the road, uh, the climate summit that the Secretary General has called um, is taking place right now. And there, uh, the discussion is about, can we actually still stop these hurricanes from getting worse? Can we? Um, deal with a scenario in which the world is confronted with climate change beyond control. And it's both mitigation, as they call it, and adaptation. And I think in both, uh, the kinds of work, the kinds of technologies and platforms you're developing could become immensely helpful, and in some cases already are. Jude, let me turn to you for a moment. Playmob, um, founder, CEO, obviously a passion that you have been able to combine in terms of your own interests. and the vision that you associate with it. Tell us a bit more about Playmob and why does it matter beyond just the fun of gaming? Mm. So, um, so Playmob is, we're kind of a, a slightly different type of games company. We make um, mini games which are no more than two minutes long um, and they're packaged up as a, a playable advert that could be distributed through existing mobile games. Um, so imagine you're playing um, Angry Birds or Candy Crush and you get to the end of a level and before you move on to your next level, there's a space to, uh, there's a media space. 
and, and typically what you see in here is a video or an interstitial, um, but we can take our mini games and place them in this space so that um, we've got access to the 2.6 billion people play mobile games. So we've got access to get information to them. Um, we make the mini games based around um, big global issues and we help them understand, we help players understand what the issues are in really kind of fun and simple terms and help them see how they could take action. Um, so you play the game, you learn, you're educated about the topic, um, you can make pledges, choices, um, and you can go on to learn more. So essentially it's about you know, planting a seed um, to inspire people to be able to take action around big global issues like climate change. Um, and, and why it matters is because you know, 2.6 billion people play games um, and they play for about 16 billion hours per week. Um, the audience now is about 50-50 male-female. Um, and if you look at the growth of gaming, and it's 8% year on year, and um, in areas like Africa and the Middle East, um, gaming has grown at about 26% each year because more people have got access to a smartphone um, and more access to the internet. And the number one thing that we do on our devices is play games. Um, so we're basically making a really accessible way for people to access um, important information, but through gaming. And, and we believe it's a great tool to be able to educate people in, with, on different topics, but inspire them to take action. Um, you know, especially you know, if you look at Gen Z and millennials, um, you know, it's not just about giving information, but it's showing like this is what we can do to make a difference. And so that's why it's important. Some people might say the numbers you are citing in terms of time spent gaming mm. is taking us into a sort of virtual universe that um, may separate us from reality. So where, where do you close the loop again? I mean, is gaming, as you also are trying to develop it, something that can engage us also in, in the real world again, mm. that makes us not just be entertained, but perhaps better informed? And mm. That's an art as much as a technology question. So where does the ingenuity of gaming development come from that you look for in the people that you bring in to work with you? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in, in terms of our methodology, so I think you, know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, what we are passionate about is not, um, is bringing people back into the real world in order to inspire them to take action. So it's not about kind of sitting, playing games for hours and hours. I mean, there's two important factors here. There's um, time constraints that people have. You know, not everyone has got hours to sit and spend playing a game, a console game or a PC game. Some people may do that, but it's not um, um, mainstream. More people would play mobile games because they can drop in and out and play, um, you know, bite-sized pieces of content. Um, and also our attention spans are becoming shorter. So that's why we create really small experiences which are no more than two minutes long because um, we need to appeal to people who um, you know, are looking for that bite-sized short-term experience. But um, it's really important that we bring people back into the real world. Um, and you know, they may continue, if they play one of our games, they, they may then go back into the game that they were playing to play uh, for a bit more time. But you know, typically, you'd play mobile games for about 20 minutes. You know, it's not the sort of game that you'd play for you know, three to four hours at a time, you know, like the likes of Call of Duty or um, you know, a big console game. Right. Mm. Augustine, just back to what you said earlier on. You said you know, beyond gadgets and things that we might wear today, it's, um, it's that virtual reality in which you are developing uh, new ways of being able to operate within them. What, what are some of the biggest changes that lie ahead of us, I mean, in our sort of immediate future? And how could that, if you could relate it back to my world, perhaps a little bit, we work in developing countries. Now, every kid in a developing country would love to play a game, but they may not have access to broadband yet, or they may have to, you know, spend nine tenths of the day um, looking after cattle, fetching water. How do we bring this world together? And, and will technology help us or will it divide us further? I'm hoping it will not divide us. Um, I think one of the most exciting things about spatial computing is that you don't put on a device and disappear into a virtual world. Um, our mission is to bring it out so that we can you know, reduce this, the whole looking at your phone all the time and your computer all the time, that you're having kind of face-to-face -face conversations with the information with you. Um, and there's, um, there's going to be something amazing, I think, that's going to happen in the next one to five years, which is when we pair this with 5G. I know that not everyone will have it, but it will soon bring people um, connected to the world where they can actually you know, volumetrically see themselves um, across great distances so we can cut down travel and actually be where we need to be without flying. Now that is a great piece of news because we just made in UNDP a climate promise last week which is that we have to cut our emissions in the next six years by 25% and by the year 2030 by 
we have no idea how we can do this because obviously being the United Nations, it is about being in different places together with our member states, our partners. So stopping travel altogether is not an option, but so much travel could actually be reduced if we could make the experience of communicating more powerful. So how likely is it that in the next two to three years I could have virtual meetings that feel almost like we're in a room together, but we're sitting all over the world? It's very close. You think it you is can very do it close. In, in a year? Really? Yeah, I think so. So can we join forces and maybe um, mm -hmm. try this out? Because we also need to make it work for people who may not be on the international highway of uh, either you know, wealth or connectivity. But I would love us to sort of find shortcuts because the vast majority of people who will start traveling, in addition to those already travel in the next few years, happen to live in developing countries. So um, this is one area. But mm. um, Augustine, that, that ability to jump into a totally different realm, how, how is that also influencing gaming and the development of games? I mean, are technologies going to give you a way of doing what you're doing right now in a totally different way? In terms of new types of gaming technology? And yes, I mean, that the experience either or, or the way that you can connect people into something far more interactive, which has been one of the great breakthroughs already in recent years. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if you, if you look at gaming, kind of gaming's always been at the forefront of innovation and tech. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, technology that we see today, um, like virtual reality, has been in the gaming space for you know, a long time. Um, so yeah, it'll be exciting to see where we can take things, especially if you look at you know, augmented reality, mixed reality, like the work that you're doing with virtual reality. Um, and in terms of the work that, that we do, being able to kind of take it that step further as well. I mean, beyond the technology side, um, kind of looking at how gaming is being used um, by players. So eSports, for example, is a really exciting opportunity. It's massive. Um, and uh, you know, we think there's you know, a great opportunity there to be able to take like, methods like what we have to be able to implement it into audiences of 60,000 people to get people playing together um, to take action and kind of look at the impact of their action in real time. Um, so I think as well as the technology side, there's the, the, the different events, opportunities and methodology of gaming, which is really exciting. How do users discover games in the world of today? I mean, mm. what, what is it that will make a game that you develop suddenly become um, a game that you say, this is, you know, reached well beyond what I had expected? Mm. Do you have to push it or you simply put it out there and people start discovering it? What, what drives a game to the front of, mm. of, you know, the various platforms on which you can buy them today? Yes, I mean, I think in terms of kind of uh, Gaming outside of what we do, uh, um, you know, you, you've got kind of popular IPs that um, have been around for, for years and years that you know um, people follow like fans. Um, but in terms of the work that we do, um, and, and this is really important because so my background was, was developing games for education and training. And I think one of the frustrations was there was amazing content being developed, but nobody saw it. Um, so how do you get this amazing content in front of people? And it's to be where they are. And where are they? They're all playing mobile games. <laughs> um, so but being able to use the channels um, in a kind of non-interruptive place where people are already on their terms is really important. And that's how people are discovering new types of content or you know, especially the work that we're doing. Um, and you can reinforce that by um, you know, sending the same people a bit of content over a period of time and then building up that interest in the topic and then being able to drive them somewhere else. So, so the work that we do with mini games will not be kind of the, the, the first and last stop. There'll be another place that they can go to then, to then do more. And that could be a bigger, wider game that people can participate in. So it's kind of looking at kind of clever ways of where people are. And that's why I mentioned esports as well, because you know, esports is such a, a, a popular phenomenon right now. And um, if you look at YouTube, um, you know, the most popular content on YouTube is watching people play games. So how can we leverage these other types of gaming channels in order to be seen by gamers um, and get them excited? And you know, looking at kind of gaming techniques as well, like um, you know, using gamification techniques, time-based tournaments, playing against celebrities, all of this gamers love. Um, so it's just kind of been very creative in terms of you've got this piece of content, how do you get people playing it and coming together as a community? That idea of coming together, I mean, back to, to Magic Leap for a moment, Augustine. I mean, when you are developing, you know, the kinds of um, either services or, or platforms on which people can then operate, how much does something like climate change feature in this? I mean, maybe all of you as individual employees are concerned, care about it. And we're here at the Social Goods Summit. It's 10th anniversary. And for the first time, it's actually been dedicated to one theme, one topic, climate change, because it's so all pervasive. Um, 
we are sitting on this couch here talking about technologies that maybe five, ten years ago nobody would have connected to the issue of climate change, and yet they are actually in many ways central to it. Does a magic leap conversation around uh, you know, the table with a coffee deal with climate change, or it's just too far out there? Well, Magic Leap headquarters is in Florida, so uh, it is a, a deep Inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're very passionate about um, being involved in the discussions of climate change. I actually think these being invited here and you know, sitting alongside someone that makes games, I think these uncommon partnerships are gonna create new solutions that we haven't thought of before that's actually gonna be able to solve these problems. Great motto, because I, I must admit, I personally believe that much of what we associate with that digital future, that realm, which many of us, I think even in the profession often cannot anticipate perhaps two to five years in advance, mm -hmm. What is quite clear is it's going to change the way we can do things across the world, well beyond just the individual experience, the individual connectivity. Um, I currently had something called the Secretary General's High Level Task Force on Digital Finance and the Sustainable Development Goals. Digital finance is going to change everything in many ways for rich people but for poor people. And I think part of the conversation we wanted to have here today just as a glimpse is that in the way that digital universe evolves in the coming years, can either just be something that is a, you know, a, an individual indulgence or it can be part of a larger story of how we live together on a planet with 7 billion people, how we deal with climate change, how we deal perhaps with thinking about the land on which we live and operate, on which we consume, pollute, produce. We could do things much more intelligently because the information we can bring together is available in a totally different format. So um, to bring our session to an end, I'm going to turn to Jude in a minute to press a button. But essentially, we have not met personally before, but our two institutions mm -hmm. have met. And we embarked on a project that speaks a little bit to making our work compatible with that digital world in which we now operate. And that's how we met. And I'm very grateful, Jude, that you agreed to help us do something that we deeply believe could be part of empowering many of the young people we currently see in the streets around the world standing up and actually asking us to do more. And that is to bring gaming into this whole climate change conversation in a way that helps to empower young people because part of the problem that we have is that adults, people who run institutions, including people like myself or in businesses or in, in governments, we think we are best placed to transact the many choices that have to be made. And we have to make choices in our everyday lives, um, in the things that perhaps we want to stop doing or that we want to have our society invest in. And young people are essentially excluded from that. They're not 18, they cannot vote, they cannot be in parliaments. So from that point of view, gaming becomes another way in which we can create a space, first of all, to be better informed, but also to exercise choices. So in a moment, we are going to uh, run a video that will um, just give you a small advanced glimpse of something called Mission 1.5. It's a game that uh, Playmob is uh, developing with us to launch in a couple of months' time, and I hope that um, this will be an experience that millions of people across the planet will be able to use as another way of becoming involved in the effort to address climate change. So I don't know, Judith, if you want to say something else on top of that, or just press the button, or whatever. Um, no, I just to say, you know, thank you so much for the opportunity to work on this because it's um, for us, you know, this is, you know, um, what we were made to do. So it's been really exciting, kind of developing this and testing it at the moment, and um, you know, I think we're going to see some amazing results. So we were meant to meet. Yep. Thank you to both of you. Thank you for being here and for what you do, and thank you for finding time to become part of a global conversation about how your world interacts and intersects with perhaps things that we try to bring to the attention of the world that need our both collective focus and, and passion. Thank you very much and uh, a quick, quick video. See you. Thank you.